Hello and welcome to Faith Fire Media. I am so excited for what we're going to delve into today. I'm Frank Mickens. Can't wait to talk about the greatest power. What does it mean? What does it mean to be the greatest power? We're going to talk a little bit about that and some phenomenal dreams the Lord has given me to illustrate this. And of course, we're going to dig into the Word of God. I'm Frank Mickens. You're watching and listening to Faith Fire Media. We'll be right back after this. excited for what I have to share for you today. This really is where we're going to delve into what we're calling today the greatest power. What is the greatest power? What is Jesus saying to us about the greatest power in the earth? And I'm going to, as I always do, talk about some dreams the Lord has given me that has illustrated for me just what this greatest power is and how we're supposed to operate in the greatest power right now in your life with Jesus Christ. Just another a real quick introduction about who I am. I'm Frank Mickens, a 20-year veteran of television news. I worked in Greensboro, North Carolina, Jackson, Mississippi, and Indianapolis, mainly as a reporter, investigative reporter, and most recently as an anchor for the last more than a decade of my career. And the Lord called me radically out of television news. I had an opportunity to resign in Indianapolis, and the Lord said no, and I didn't understand why. And he began to show me and my wife this path we're on right here with you right now, where we are going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ prophetically with power, with passion, with purity, and do so so that you may begin to walk in a new level of depth, understanding, wisdom, power, freedom in Christ Jesus. We are the proud founders of a ministry called Faith Fire Worldwide Revival Ministries, and it's a 501c3 ministry, and we have a threefold mission. We want to use sports and entertainment venues to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where we are right now. This is a venue of sports and entertainment, but also we want to see a national day of revival. Can you imagine a day where America doesn't just stop to pray like on the National Day of Prayer, but we get together and say, this is a day we've chosen to reconnect with Jesus Christ. I want to see that. The Lord has put that in our spirit to pray toward that and work toward that on a national scale in the United States of America and who knows, perhaps around the world. And thirdly, we want to use uh, the media to broadcast revival all over the world, broadcast a vibrant, on-fire relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Faith Fire Media is where we're doing this. Either you're listening to us right now on your favorite podcast platform or you're watching us on YouTube. Either way, this is what we do. We come to Faith and the flame of revival around the world. And this is just one of the mediums that we use to do that. So now that we got that out of the way again, I'm your host, Frank Mickens on Faith Fire Media. And we're going to talk today again about the greatest power, the greatest power. So I'm going to talk to you beginning with a couple of dreams the Lord gave me. And I got these in the beginning of May. And I'm going to share this with you as quickly as I can, because it really illustrates, I think, so well about the heart of Jesus Christ for his bride, the church. And we're talking about the greatest power. And maybe you can guess what the greatest power is. I haven't uh, been given the permission yet to share what it is. I'm going to leave that dangling out there. But let me tell you about this dream. I was in a garden and there was a man there. He was there with a, uh, a wife. He made the garden for his wife. So this is Jesus Christ. And we're in the Garden of Eden. And I was aware that his wife had a terminal illness and that terminal illness was sin. And so this man was the Lord Jesus. He was sitting in a tree next to his wife and he was crying. And I asked him, are you crying? And he didn't say anything, but I knew he was sad about his wife's impending death, that he had only so much time left with her. And I was there admiring the flowers in Eden. I was kneeling down next to a flower bush, these bluish purple flowers. I had never seen anything like them. They were so vibrant and beautiful. They were almost like roses, but they weren't. They had a blue purple color, unlike any other color on the spectrum I've ever seen. And Jesus, in this vision, this dream, had on a hat, and he was in his senior years, which doesn't make sense. Jesus is eternal. But I knew in the dream that he had decided to grow old with his wife, that he wanted to have fellowship with her and show her he understood that he was experiencing with her the decay that comes through sin and death. And he just loved her that well. He wanted to walk with her as this impending death was approaching because of her terminal illness, which is sin. And so the Lord really started dealing with me about how he loves his bride, the church, the body of Christ, the people of God. And, and in this, 
he decided he wanted to suffer with her as she approached death. And she was unaware her death was even coming. He didn't tell her what was about to happen. And he suffered with her in silence, waiting for the moment she would not uh, that she would find out about her terminal illness. And he chose to grow old with her. And I could tell in the dream, I'm reading my notes, that he was eternal and did not have to grow old, but he chose to identify with his bride, to be compassionate, to be her companion, to be close to her, to comfort her, to be near her, to be next to her. This is Jesus. This is what I wrote down. And he never responded to me. Never responded to me. I knew he was crying. I remember seeing the dress that he got his bride. It was white. It was delicate, brand new, never worn. And she wasn't going to wear it until later. He got it for her. And um, I said to him, don't cry. It's going to be OK. But he never said anything. He decided to to identify with her sadness, with her terminal illness and the impact of it. He just sat next to his wife and cried silently, trying not to allow her or anyone else to see him crying. He was just sitting high in the trees on a branch, the seat he made into the tree. And he made it into this tree somehow. It was like part of the tree. And I knew he owned this beautiful and huge garden. And I knew that it wasn't going to last. It was Eden. So it was like the Lord was showing me his heart after the fall, that he had made this beautiful garden and it wasn't going to last. But he had a plan, of course, to redeem it and bring it back. So in this, I, I was receiving revelation about how much Jesus loves us, even in our sin how much he identifies us, even in our imperfection, how much he chooses to identify by experience. Remember, he came as the incarnate Christ and was afflicted just like us. And he, as the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, that he's acquainted in every single way with all the things we deal with. Right. And so this is God's heart. He loves us. He loves us even in our imperfections. So you probably have gotten right now by now the greatest love, the greatest power, I should say, is love. The greatest power is love. Our topic today is the greatest power. So that's the first dream. And let's just lay that groundwork. And I'm going to give you some word here. I'm going to lay the groundwork. That dream sent me into several different scriptures. And uh, let's see. I'm going to read from you what I what I got out of this from Revelation chapter 21. And it says in verse two, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So Jesus saw from Eden the future that that there was going to be a redemption. But he first had to come and identify with us and love us well. He had to show us the greatest power, the bride of Christ the new Jerusalem, the people of God, the, the royal family. He had to first come, identify with us, love us, serve us, even in the midst of our sin, even after the fall, even after there was a terminal illness that had been introduced into perfection. He chose to sit with us. He chose to be near us. He didn't shun us. He didn't judge us. He didn't critique us. He found a way to be with us and stay close to us. And of course, we know Jesus came, put his life on the line, died on a cross so his blood could wash away our sin so that we could be brought near him and we could be adorned with that wedding dress when the Lord returns and will be his bride in heaven for all of eternity in New Jerusalem. So this is in the book. This is God's heart. This is Jesus's heart. But let me tell you another dream. I got that same night that exposed two situations going on in the body of Christ that don't really agree with the greatest power, that we have received the greatest power, but we're not yet walking in the greatest power. And the Lord gave me this this morning. He said, it's not enough to do love. You need to be love love, that we need to be as Jesus was. Remember, we're being conformed to the image of his son. We're being conformed to look like Jesus. We're being conformed to Jesus Christ, transformed by Jesus Christ. So we don't look like the world, but in fact, we prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God by what? How we show people love, how we embody love, how we love one another. We can't just do love. We have to be loved just like Jesus was. Jesus could have come and just done good works, but he chose to die. He became love. He embodied love. He, he illustrated love when he, by grace, by agape, sacrificial love, deferential, preferential love, decided to love people who had a terminal illness that didn't deserve love. And we need to embody that kind of love, that we don't look at people by the flesh, as the, the Bible says, but we instead look at them by the spirit. We see their hidden treasure. We see the, the value God has put inside of them by his spirit, and that we don't judge people and love people by their condition, but we choose to embody love by serving them where they are. We walk with them in the midst of their terminal 
illness. We walk with them in the midst of that which has been lost and we're near them, close to them. And we choose to be in fellowship with them and embody love by being close to them and bringing them close and dying to ourselves so that we can love other people. That is what Jesus died for. He didn't die just for us to bring us into heaven. He died for us to be love, to be like him, to embody love in the earth so that Eden could be expressed again, so that people can see a taste of Eden, the taste of the perfection of Jesus, the taste of the perfection of creation. When God created everything, he called it good. He didn't have sin in his heart. He didn't have sin in creation. He didn't put sin here, but the enemy tricked us and allowed uh, basically us an opportunity to bring sin into the world, and we invited it, and so Jesus is now redeeming what was lost. And we just got to really stand in that to understand the greatest power is love. The greatest power is not hope. The greatest power is not faith. The greatest power is love. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that last verse says, these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So let me tell you about this other dream. So it was in the same night. First, I'm being shown the amazing sacrificial love of Jesus, who's acquainted with grief, right? He's a man of sorrows. He's crying in this dream. Why? Because he so wants to be with his bride who has been uh, tricked and and basically duped into forfeiting her eternity. And now he's walking with her, identifying with her, weeping with her, loving her, even in the midst of her destitution. And, and we want to be more like that. But let me show you how God showed me how we are in this season of time. So in this dream, there was a young lady in modern times. She was traumatized. And I was talking to a friend. and He was telling me that this lady was his girlfriend. So this was Jesus telling me about his girlfriend. And I was with him prior to this young lady going on trial. I remember being told my friend was concerned about her. I could tell he loved her, but they were no longer in relationship. So his heart was not for her to be his girlfriend. His heart was for her to be his bride. Stay right there. Remember that. Jesus' heart is not for us to be his girlfriend, to be in and out of relationship. And we go on dates here and there, but we don't live together. We don't walk together. We're not in covenant together. His heart was for this woman to be his bride. But it wasn't yet the situation. They weren't in relationship as they should be. He longed for her and he was telling me about her troubles and her upbringing and her problems. And I remember saying, wow, what happened to her? And I knew that she had been traumatized. So this is the church. We're supposed to be his bride, but we're acting like his girlfriend. Why? Because we've been traumatized. But my friend, Jesus Christ, wouldn't give me the details about her trials and tribulations because he respected her too much than to share her most personal struggles. I'm going to say that again. He respected her too much than to share her most permanent uh, personal struggles. He respected his 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 woman, his bride who was not treating him as if he was her husband. He respected her too much than to go and spill her drama into the streets. He dignified her. He respected her. He did not condemn her. He was going to watch the trial and it was hurting him that she was going through more hardship. So the body of Christ is going through trial and it hurts the Lord. But the trial is there for a reason. It's to wake us up to who we are in Christ, who we are to Christ. He longed to be near her. He longed to be with her during the trial. But she and he were no longer close. And I could tell in the dream her past and troubles had made it hard for her to trust and have a committed and transparent and vulnerable relationship with Christ. So the bride of Christ, the, the things we've been through personally and corporately have put us at odds at times with Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that people don't serve the Lord. I'm not saying that church, uh, the church hasn't been serving the Lord and ministering to the Lord. But there's a level that the Lord want us, wants us to get to that we've not yet attained. We've not yet gotten to the point. But Jesus, I'm going to continue to read in my notes. He has compassion for his church because he understands that he's waiting for her to come back. He longed for her for a, from a distance, waiting for the moment she would be open to being in relationship again. Now, listen to this. I knew in this dream that the woman represented the church and uh, my friend was in a, a high place. So this was Jesus. He was in a tower. This is really cool. And he had to come down to see the trial. He had to come down and see the trouble she was going through. And he climbed down on the outside of the tower, or I did, over the balcony gates made of wrought iron. And I went down to a lower level to watch this because I had gone up to be with Jesus. And then I was coming back down to where this bride was going on trial. And then the dream switched to a different scene. 
And I knew, by the way, that this bride was prophetic, that she had been walking in prophecy. And I knew that it was this, the portion of the body of Christ that recently has been operating a prophetic function, but it has been false prophecy. So there's been some issue with the relationship between some folks in the body of Christ and their relationship with Jesus. And it caused a situation where it was possible for them to false or falsely prophesy or have presumptions and prophesy presumptions. And I'm talking about the election, those who prophesied about Donald Trump's win, people prophesying about the pandemic being over, people prophesying these things. And the reason why these things weren't true and didn't come true is it exposed an issue of the heart that people were gifted, continue to be gifted in prophetic function, continue to be gifted by the spirit. But since there's an issue in the relationship, they're treating Jesus like their boyfriend and not husband. They're out of covenant. They're not truly walking with Jesus in a way that serves Jesus. They're maybe serving themselves or serving something else. We don't know. Because of that, there's a trial going on. There's judgment coming. There is trouble. There is discomfort, and, and it hurts Jesus. He wants to be near her again, but for now, he's allowing this trial. And he's watching it, and there's, a, there's an outcome. But that prophetic element of the body of Christ is still loved. And, and so this is where the dream switched. So I climbed into what looked like a tram on a track. So it wasn't a train, but more like a tram. And if you've ever been to Disney World, there's that tram that takes you from the parking lot into Disney World. It looked a lot like that. And this tram was carrying religious leaders. They were wearing vestments, um, which you would see priests wear. And they were putting this young lady on trial. So one par portion of the body of Christ is putting another portion of the body of Christ on trial. And everyone already knew the outcome. She was guilty, but there was no compassion for her. The religious leaders just wanted blood. They wanted someone to blame. They wanted someone to condemn. And as I climbed into this open air tram over the side of it and sat next to one of these priests, I asked him a question about the trial, but he never responded. There was no heart, no compassion, no emotion. So he wasn't representing the heart of Jesus. He was representing uh, f judgment without love, without compassion. And so these religious leaders had decided they were going to excommunicate this young lady, this other portion of the body of Christ, to get it over with. They didn't care about her life, her heart, her pain. They just wanted to condemn her. She was a sinner, only worthy of condemnation. And here I am sitting there, and I saw a cross on a chain in the priest's lap. I'm going to say it again. I'm sitting next to this priest and I saw a cross on a chain in the priest's lap. You've probably seen that before, the jewelry that is part of the vestments that you see at some of the ceremonial, traditional uh, church settings. That was what I saw. But that person had no way to make room for the cross in his heart. So he's wearing an outward expression of Jesus' sacrificial bloodletting love, but he didn't have it in his heart. For him, the cross was decoration. It's an idol to be worshipped. It's not a reason to have compassion for the sinning church member. So I'm sitting there, and the priest was asked to provide help to another priest who requested materials for the trial. So they're preparing for the trial. And he wanted material to be prepared to judge the woman. He wanted to judge the woman who was walking in prophecy. And he was preparing to judge a woman while simultaneously being unprepared himself. He was imperfect, but he was about to judge another imperfect person. I'm going to stop right there. So here we are seeing two issues in the body of Christ. There's a portion of the body of Christ that's kind of gone wayward in prophetic function. There's an issue with their relationship with Jesus Christ, and he's allowing trial to come. And the trial's coming by other people in the body of Christ who are judging this woman who's been walking in prophecy and judging her according to what they think they should have been, uh, she should have been doing, but not to restore her or repair relationship, but literally just to judge her. Literally, the only thing they wanted to do was judge her. And that's not the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus is loving in the, in the Garden of Eden, that other dream. He's loving the woman, his bride, who has a terminal illness and walking with her through the trial, walking with her through the decay, walking with her through the impact of sin instead of taking opportunity to judge and condemn her. He's showing her his love and kindness, which is what leads to repentance. But these folks, these were very religious folks. I knew this represented a religious spirit. And they're pointing the finger instead of trying to figure out how to come close like Jesus does. These people just wanted to put their fellow brothers and sisters on trial who were walking in prophecy. So this person is nonchalantly, I'm continuing with my notes, participating in a trial that would alter this woman's life. He had no appreciation for the pain, the decision, or the judgment would cause. It was just another trial. And she was just another guilty person. He didn't even have to prepare. He came into the tram car where I was sitting next to this priest. And this priest I was with seemed to be a leader, the head priest. 
a high up leader, and he didn't even care to give another priest what he requested to prepare. They didn't really need to prepare. He was asked to give dozens of books. He only gave the priest three books. So it was really a a uh, railroading of this woman. They didn't even they didn't even need evidence. They just they had seen enough. They're going to railroad her. And there was no appreciation for the cost of judging his sister in Christ. And I noticed the books were all about prophecy. And I saw the word seer and I saw the word prophecy and I knew they were judging this woman because she prophesied. She represented the charismatic people of the church and she was being judged as a false prophet by people who never believed in prophecy or prophecy as it is today. They had been waiting for an opportunity to condemn and excommunicate the woman who prophesied. She was also far from her friend, so she felt alone. So we have two tracks going. We've got one portion of the body of Christ. They didn't believe in prophecy operating today. They were waiting for an opportunity to judge the charismatic church, and they got their opportunity. And so they're out of relationship with Jesus because they're not showing the compassion and the repairing and redempting heart of Jesus Christ. And then you have the, the party of the body of Christ, the charismatic part, that had been, yes, participating in false prophecy that had been tainted by a poor relationship with Jesus Christ. But instead of being repaired and being repaired by Jesus Christ, since she is also out of relationship with Jesus, she feels alone. And that's what we have right now in the body of Christ, a lot of finger pointing and a lot of isolation. And the Lord's calling all of us into close relationship, just like he was in relationship with that woman in the tree in Eden. He's calling us into relationship and we shouldn't be judging our brother and sister. We shouldn't even be trying to shy away from the Lord repairing us for our sins or our shortcomings or our, or our things that we need forgiveness for. We need to be seeking that close relationship, not treating him like a boyfriend, but treating him like who he is, a husband whom we are in covenant it with. So her friend was there the whole time, but she still felt alone because she was not opening the door for her friend. So this is the charismatic church. Jesus is still right there with the charismatic church, even though some people in the body of Christ might think that Jesus is rejecting the charismatic church or the portion of the church that's walking in charismatic gifts. But that's not the case. He's still there, but she needs to open the door for him to come in and really take charge again and really love her into life again. And he's sitting there, I'm reading my notes again, and Jesus is hoping and patiently waiting, patiently waiting, I should say, for her to welcome him back into close relationship. Jesus is not condemning the prophetic community that has strayed from intimacy and vulnerability with him in true and pure relationship. He's standing at the door and knocking. These are my notes again. He wants to be invited back inside. While the religious folks are driving a stake through her, they're wanting to nail her into a coffin and condemn her to being a blasphemer. And I'm sitting there in this dream, and I remember this was all happening at night, just like the judgment of Jesus by the religious leaders prior to his crucifixion. These leaders, just like the leaders in the, uh, in the Bible, wanted blood. They just wanted to kill this part of the church. They did not discern the Lord's body in this case. They just wanted to cut the charismatic church off from the body, toss her away, throw away the key. They wanted to rid themselves of her. And I was hearing throughout the dream, I stand at the door and knock. And I also heard beam and I also heard despise not prophesying. So we have one part of the church that's gone too far in too far away from their relationship with Christ and into prophecy out of relationship, which made it out an opportunity for false prophecy and presumptuous prophecy. Then we have another part of the church walking in critical religion, which is a spirit of hypocrisy. Because they're imperfect, just like this priest is imperfect. So they're pointing the finger with a beam in their own eye and trying to call out the speck in their brother and sister's eye. But remember what the Bible says. Remember what the Bible says. I'm in Revelation chapter 3. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We need to understand that, yes, he chastises, but the point is for him to come in to communion with us, to dine with us, to rest with us, to be in perfect relationship with us, to be in that tree in Eden together and be in relationship and communion. And so what we have to be careful is that we don't overcorrect. Yeah, we saw a lot of false prophecy over the election season, but we don't want to overcorrect and be out of love and start condemning our brother or our sister because they believe in charismatic gifts and they have a prophetic gift and they walk a prophetic function. And we don't want to be on the opposite end of the spectrum where we think, oh, well, I have a prophetic gift. I don't need to be in pure relationship with Jesus. I've got a gift and I can use it on my own and I don't need I don't need Jesus Christ to be walking with me through the whole thing. No. 
We've got to operate in the gifts of the Spirit with the Spirit, or we can find ourselves defiled and we can find ourselves tainted. And so encouragement for really anyone listening right now, wherever you are on the spectrum, maybe you're not on any, either end of this spectrum. You're kind of in the middle trying to feel all of this out. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. There is a God who sent a son, his name is Jesus Christ, who decided he wanted to be like us. He put himself in flesh so that he could identify with us in every place. The Bible says he was tempted in every place. Why? Because he didn't want to condemn the world. The Bible says he came to save the world. He came so the world would not be condemned. The Bible says he loved the world. He loves the people on the earth, and he wants to see those people come into relationship with him. So we've got to be careful in this season that we don't become so high and mighty or thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to, that we just despise prophecy. And I'm going to read that scripture. Remember, that's one of the things I heard in this dream, despise not prophecy. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm starting in verse 19. It says, quench not the spirit. So we can't overcorrect. And then it says, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And that means that prophecy is good, but you need to prove it. It needs to be tested. It needs to be waited on. It needs to be watched over. It needs to be... Seen for what it is, the fruit needs to be inspected. And so we just need to embrace the process of charismatic gifts that, yes, people can get off. People can go left field. People can do things that they're not authorized to do. But that does not mean that we just part and parcel wholesale, throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. No, 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 no. That is not what we need to do. That is not what we need to do. Not at all. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, we've got to remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to wrap up with this. Love is indeed the greatest power. And the love I'm talking about is not action. It's being. Jesus is love. He didn't just do love. He is love. And I'm going to read the uh, New King James Version. And let's get to that real quick. It says, love never fails. No, hold on. I went to the wrong verse. All right, we're going 1 Corinthians 13. I'm pulling it up here on my uh, iPad. And we're going to read the last verse, which is verse 13. And it says, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So a lot of the things we're trying to solve in our communities, a lot of the things we're trying to solve in the body of Christ, we're trying to do it with hope. We're trying to inspire people. And the Lord was talking to me. He said, hope without love is inspiration. So if I don't love you and I'm giving you hope, I'm inspiring you, but I'm not pointing you somewhere. I'm not pointing you toward love. I'm pointing you toward something ephemeral. I'm pointing you toward success in some area. And then there's faith without love. And faith without love is confrontational. So you get inspiration from hope without love. You get confrontation from faith without love. And that's what we saw with that religious spirit, that hypocrisy, where I'm just going to tell you what's right. and I'm not going to show you what's right. We, we can't live like that. We've got to tell people what's right. While we're showing them what's right, we've got to embody love. And this is the call on all of us. You might not be a person that finds yourself criticized in the charismatic church, for instance, but I believe the Lord was exposing kind of an issue or an area of growth for the body of Christ in general, that we need to grow up into the idea of embodying love, not just being right. And I remember the whole reason I started studying this particular verse is I was at an event, and at that event, somebody was wearing a hat, and that hat said faith. And I was like, wow, that's a cool hat. But then the Lord started ministering to me saying, well, Frank, is the point faith? And I know some people might like, wow, yeah, the point is faith, that we are saved by grace through faith. Yes, I get it. We are saved by grace through faith, no doubt. But that faith is not possible without love. Love conquers all. What does it say? That the multitude of sins is covered by love. That the Bible says fear there's no fear in love. Love is the greatest power. It says it right here. Now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest is love. So our challenge, my challenge even to you, and I'm challenging myself, walk in love, embody love. That means loving like Jesus, who put himself on a cross, allowed them to nail his hands and feet to a tree and bleed out and cry out to his father, why are you forsaking me? Because his soul was just so distraught and tormented. But his spirit was willing. His spirit was strong. He knew he had to endure hardship. He had to endure hardship as a good soldier. He had to endure temptation. He had to endure death 
He had to go through death as an eternal being so he could understand the death that we experience. That's the kind of love we need. And the Lord said this to me. He said, love has nothing to do with the people you're near as much as it has to do with the people who are far away from you. It's easy to love or easier to love people who are close to you. It's easier to love the people who are in your family. It's easier to love the people that you work with than maybe somebody who's a stranger or transgender or, or has an issue with gender identity or sexuality. Or maybe they have an issue with mental health illness or they're homeless. The Lord says we've got to be like Jesus Christ. To love means to be. The lo to love means to be close. To love means to reach out. What do we learn in Luke chapter 15? The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a woman who lost a, to a coin and she went and swept everywhere to find that coin. Why? She saw the value and the treasure in that one coin. And that's how Jesus sees all of us as stars in the sky. We are his bright lights in the earth and he wants to shine us. He wants to dust us off so we can shine brightly. And so he's always coming to us to be near us. And that's why the greatest power is love. That love is what pulls, pushes, uh, empowers. Um, it's the passion of Christ. That's why Jesus Christ came because he is love and he's calling us to embody love just as he does. So listen, we can't be judgmental. We can't be quenching the Holy Spirit by withholding love from each other. No, we've got to walk in the greatest power. And that means to love people who are far away from you. Who could be farther away in my dream than people who are maybe Catholic or Episcopalian and people who are in charismatic circles? They couldn't be farther apart in the body of Christ. The theologies are very much different, but we're still in the same body and Jesus loves us the same. And so we've got to figure out how do we love people who are far away from us when really by blood we're in the same family? And how do we love people who are far away from us who are not yet in the family? And this is where I share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life and they will not perish. Jesus saw you in your sin, in your destitution, just like we talked about in that dream in Eden. And he decided to endure it with you and give you his life so his blood could wash your sins away and atone for your sins and satisfy the judgment that comes from sin because love does not sin. So when we're sinning, we're not loving. So love had to come and cover our sins because judgment comes with sin. And that's what Jesus did. He came and took that judgment away. And I want you to know that Jesus is alive today. Jesus rose on the third day with all power of heaven and earth in his hands and his power is in me. And that's why I'm here right now sharing this with you. It's the power of the greatest love, the greatest power in me sharing with me, the, sharing with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not Frank Mickens. It's Jesus in me sharing you how he loves you and, and does everything for you. And so if that's you, you can say with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that you believe he rose on the third day and walks in power now and is alive and you are saved. And we want to hear from you. We want to connect you with a discipling ministry. We want to connect you so that you can grow in your faith and you can grow in healing, uh, being healed and being set free and delivered from this world that has tried to suck life out of you. Again, the topic today is the greatest power. We want you to know the greatest power. Contact us, faithfireworldwide.com. Contact us, 202-735-1347, 202-735-1347. You can sign up for text alerts as well. Send FaithFire to 55498 on your phone. Faith Fire to 55498. Listen, we want to connect with you. If you've given your heart to Jesus, if you've got questions, if you want revival in your life, if you know that you're not yet walking in the greatest power, if you know that you want to love, but you can't do it because you don't love people far from you that don't look like you, don't think like you, don't walk in your zip code or your neighborhood, or maybe there's things about certain types of people who have done certain types of things that you just can't love those folks. Let's, let's, let's connect. Let's pray together. I want you to get set free from anything that quenches the Holy Spirit in your life life, any judgmentalism, any religion that causes you to walk in the traditions of men and not the tradition of God, which is to love everybody. We need to deal with that. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray with you right now. Father, in Jesus name, thank you for this word. Thank you for challenging us to be the greatest power in the earth. You call us salt of the earth and the light of the world. You want us to transform environments, atmospheres. You want us to be in in hemispheres that are only available to us by the love of Jesus in us. You want us to go into places where people are far from God and tell them about the saving grace, love, power of Jesus Christ, setting them free from sin, opening up the doors of the prison 
prison and setting captives free. God, I thank you for those who are coming into freedom right now by saying yes to Jesus. I don't even understand who you are, but I know I need a savior. I do know I'm a sinner and I need grace. I need favor. I need something I don't deserve because I can't work this out on my own. I know I'll die and go to hell if I try to do this on my own. There's not enough good work. Someone here today is saying that in their spirit. They're crying out to you, God, with tears in their heart and they're pouring out to you and you're welcoming them. You're walking with them. You're crying with them. You're seeing them in their destitution and you're lifting their head. You're lifting them out and you're saying, now, son, daughter, walk with me. So, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for this time together and we give you all the praise, glory, honor, majesty, power, and all blessing in Jesus name. Amen. I'm so proud to be here with you and privileged, honored. I pray that this was a blessing. If you're watching on YouTube, I would ask that you like this, share this. Uh, If you're watching this or listening to this on a podcast, tell a friend. I don't want this for my glory. I simply want people to be transformed and touched by the power of God's word and his glory and presence in their lives. I love you. I praise God for you. This is Faith Fire Media. That's all for now. We'll be back next week. You can be guaranteed of that. Meanwhile, you can find us at faithfireworldwide.com faithfireworldwide.com, and we'll see you next week.